Hello, everyone, and welcome back. It's the Full 40 with Chris, Rob, and Willie, part of the Nova Insider Network. It is Tuesday, March 14th, uh, right around 11.30 p.m. Guys, cheers. The season is over. (laughs) Here, here. Um, Here, here. It's been a a challenging one, obviously, to say the least. Um, And we... We'll cover a little bit of the last week and a half of basketball. Um, we'll probably move into um, we'll probably move into what to come. Talk a little bit about the rest of the Big East teams who are still in action, um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, obviously a lot of it about the women's team who's a four seed um, in their bracket. So so a lot a lot of positive things to say there. Uh, but this is now kind of an inflect. If you thought the Jay Wright retirement was an inflection point for the program, this off season might top it because it's going to get a little wild. It's, um, it's super interesting. La- we de- we delayed the inflection point. I think what we're about to go through could have happened immediately after Jay left, but we figured it out. We pulled everything together. And we, everything remained status quo, more or less. Now yes. we're getting into the great unknown. Oh, yes. Before Chris, we Chris, get what, into... was it, what was it four, four years ago we did uh, the Unwritten episode? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Little did we know. <laughs> Little did we know. We um, had, for, for our listeners, a quick reminder. I think it was after, I think it was after the 1819 season. We didn't know, we didn't know what the transition was going to be whether you're any of the new golden age or, or uh, what the future is going to bring. And we said the story is, is unwritten and it's very unwritten right now. We are going to be very interesting. Yeah. God, buckle up. Um, the Before we get into any of that, though, since our last episode, we made a few announcements um, and figured it probably makes sense to re- address that head on. Um, so you probably saw it. It's up on our Twitter page. It's up on our Instagram. There's going to be some changes coming to the full 40. Um, we have a few more episodes this season. We will have a 40s awards episode. We don't know exactly when that's going to be because we expect some news and things to happen uh, in the off in the early part of this off season with the portal window still being open. So we're trying to figure out exactly when that date's going to be. We will cover the Big East teams and um, in the in the men's tournament and in the women's tournament, especially Maddie Segrist, Denise Dillon, and the Villanova Wildcats. Um, but but after the season is over, um, Rob will be moving on from the podcast. I'm being um, forced out. This is bullshit. He's being forced out. He's been. Uh, he'll be with Mark Titus on the uh, on the Titus show. He's 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 uh, he's hitting the portal and yeah. he's and he's leaving us. <laughs> I wish that that'd be great. Um and and we'll me and Willie will be moving forward uh, with the podcast with slightly different roles. Uh, but but we're still trying to iron all of that out. Um, but Rob just wanted to give you a couple seconds to kind of give your thoughts, takes, whatever that may be there. Yeah, no, um, I mean, it's, uh, I don't know, it's obviously been a, a fun run, and I'm not totally disappearing. I have a feeling I'll be appearing, I don't know, maybe with somewhat regularity as, as I have hot takes that I need to share, or, you know, as we're getting the season going and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, no, I'm uh, obviously, you know, not leaving with any negativity, just uh going to spend some time doing some other stuff and yeah i don't know it's been a blast uh creating some some great content and developing a great podcast and want to thank all the listeners for uh for coming along for the ride and obviously it's going to be in great hands um with willie and chris going forward so excited to see you know how they take it and and kind of make it their own but i'll be around awesome appreciate it so let's uh let's 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 talk about this so in the last week so we had Colin on our last episode if you could believe it or not it feels like an eternity ago um but after that we went to the Big East tournament beat Georgetown handily 
And after that Georgetown game, I look, I mean, look, Georgetown is obviously was is and was obviously a program in major transition and a lot of rumors circulating around Georgetown right now that involve Providence. Um, but but we beat the brakes off of them, put up 80, held them to 48. And you're sitting there and looking like, OK, like the team that won those three games out of the last five down the stretch, you're like, OK, like I know it's Georgetown, but. We we got hot. Players played a little bit less minutes than we needed. We're going to be fresh for tomorrow, et cetera. And then we played Creighton, couldn't get the shots to fall. And then they systematically hit their shots. We couldn't cover screens. We didn't do a whole lot of anything that we were successful at back in, back in February when we beat the brakes off of them at the Wells Fargo center. And, uh, the Big East season came to an end. With that came our NCAA tournament hopes. And then Selection Sunday happened. Obviously, we were on the outside looking in. We get an unseated bid to the NIT to play at Liberty. Justin Moore and Cam Whitmore are injured and and don't play. Um, and And we go ahead and lose to Liberty by five. They cover. Um, they were uh, Liberty minus four. They covered the spread, and uh, and uh, and we we lose and our season's over. So that was the abridged version of what happened. But I guess we'll pass it off to you guys. And I don't think we want to belabor the point on this season too much more. But I guess the overarching theme that I saw in the last week and a half of basketball was that the season was what it was. <laughs> and yeah. I don't have a lot more to say than that. Yeah, I mean, it kind of ended, especially this last game, it really ended the way it started. I mean, we rolled out more or less the same team that we started the season with, and we got pretty much the same result that we started the season with. A team that couldn't really execute on offense, um, was a little bit steadier on defense, um, and unfortunately just kind of came up short. And yeah, I mean, for me, it was... You know, we had that that nice run a couple weeks ago where we we had that big 2-0 week, beat Xavier... And then uh, started things off well being in Seton Hall. And, you know, I mean, we, we all seem to have a little bit of hope at that point and kind of talking ourselves into, all right, can, can we see a run? And, but I mean, ultimately, once, once we lost to UConn, I think, you know, it kind of came a little bit crashing back to reality to say, all right, this, this probably isn't going to happen. It's going to be the, the longest of long shots. And, and here we are. And I don't know. It's, I don't know, just a, a weird, a weird season overall to be a part of. And I don't know, I'm kind of like, all right, let's, this one's in the books. So let's, let's move on to the next one, which I mean, I'm, I know we'll talk about it, but next year is going to be very interesting and tons and tons of question marks. Like you're alluding to Chris, like I think the next few weeks and a few months are going to be very interesting. Yeah. Flush it, you know, it, yeah. just <laughs> flush it. Um, I, Everything that you you two have said basically is how I feel. Um, we start we started exactly how we finished. Um, I did think we played better defensively today. Um, there's not much to take from the game. I mean, we shot four for twenty six. Like, so bad. you're just not like I'm surprised. Oh we my god, shooting that like you're just not going to win basketball games doing that. Um, I feel for the seniors. I feel for Caleb who definitely had his worst game in Villanova, like his Villanova career today. Um, especially just adding the weight of what we would needed to win from him. Um, and what he produced was definitely his worst. So I feel for that, like that's a really rough way to go out. Slate played well overall, um, but still tough to go out like that. Um, so I feel for those two, uh, I mean, they've battled their heart out for the program. Caleb, we always talk about Caleb as a two lane transfer. Caleb's played the last time we played from Tulane was like 2018. Yeah. Like, so literally when we won the title was the last time Caleb played for Tulane. So, or 2019, sorry, he played in 2019. Um, so it's just been so long. He's a Villanova player. He's been a great transfer. He's played super well. So thankful for him. Um, thankful for Slate, the growth that he's, he showed. Um, and just, yeah, year over year. Um, being our X factor, whatever, or yeah, being our X factor, or glue guy, whatever you want to call him. Really appreciated that. Um, and then, yeah, Justin, um, we'll see if he comes back. We'll see what the world looks like for him. Um, I'm yeah, probably, 
let's be a little bit real. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to give it, we can give it when we hear officially, but I'd expect them to go. Um, Cam, similarly, I'm, I'm going to go just on the record. Cam will not be here next year. Um, he has guaranteed $16 million waiting for him. Uh, so um, you could tell me I have $16 million waiting for me in three months. And I'm going to tell you, I would not be anywhere. I would be I <laughs> absolutely there sitting there. So yes. um just shout out to all of them. They busted their asses off off, off and everything like that. We'll do a whole lot like another thing on the 40s, but overall with this Liberty game, I don't know, flush it, shit happens. This yeah. this game wasn't gonna change our season, save our season, anything like that. So here yeah. we are. I do want to say, uh, I, I, I'm glad you brought up Caleb and, and, and Brandon. One one thing that I feel like we didn't real I, I feel like a lot of fans kind of assumed it. And I don't think it was just understanding a little bit into the weeds of the program a little bit from what I've understood. It was no guarantee that those guys came back. No. Like, yeah. like, like, and it was no guarantee that a lot of players came back. Um, and let's remember that 11 months ago, not even Jay Wright announced to the surprise of many um, most that he was retiring and we had to re-recruit all our guys. Caleb, Caleb came back. Brandon came back. Um, Longino came back. Moore came back. And and then the three big recruits, obviously, in Brendan and Armstrong and and Cam all decided to come and play for the program, despite the fact the coach they committed to play for wasn't there. And so I'm not sitting here and saying this is a – we should be – like throwing pet rose petals at their feet. But at the same time, like just realize that these guys were asked by the program to stick around. They did. And they played really fucking hard throughout the year. Whether that, whether that resulted in much, no, I don't think this team really grew a whole lot during the season, aside from just plugging in better players as the season went on. Yeah. Um, but, but at the, but, that being said, they were asked to come back. They did, despite being like 24 years old. And and so a small debt of gratitude um, to them. They didn't know anybody a thing, and they decided to come back. So so I, I credit them. Um, I mean, I'll just I'll just we allude, I've been alluding to it. We all are see. We all know we're worried about the transfer portal. Who's going to transfer? Who's going to leave? Chris, to your point, essentially. What they did was we put off by everyone coming back last year. We put off what we're going to see happen this year, last year. That's all it was. We, after Jay left, we probably would have had a mass exodus of transfers. Uh And we were able to come together, the rally, rally together, yada, yada, Villanova culture. We, it didn't affect last off season. We didn't have the season anyone wanted. Like I, we didn't want it as fans. I guarantee you every single player who's busting their ass, getting their asses kicked in summer workouts, working, you know, waking up at 5 a.m. to go lift the shack, putting up 500 shots a day. This wasn't the result that they wanted either for themselves. And as Chris alluded to, there also was, from a team perspective, less growth. I think individual players probably added more to their game, figured out stuff. Um, but from a team perspective, less growth than we wanted to see. Um and we're just gonna deal with the we 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 you know we're just gonna deal with the fallout of you know of that which frankly that's just what it's gonna be so yeah. we'll see who leaves and what leaves and all that kind of stuff but no sense hiding that we know there's going to be people leaving I don't need to pre- uh, project who but we know yeah. that people will be out well let's get into a little bit of it right like we we hinted at a couple right first of all Cam Whitmore is moving on <laughs> like like I don't. Like there still seems to be a few extra people in the Villanova fan base who don't seem to get that. And maybe the fact that he didn't play today was clarifying for those people. But but Cam Whitmore was on a one-year deal here, okay? <laughs> it was a one-year deal. And it was the one-year deal from the start. It was a one-year deal no matter who the coach was. And that's it, okay? So, yeah. Yeah. This is where I want to like I I I want to go all in on what Cam, like Cam Whitmore and everything like that. 
Um, when we recruited Cam, people people are like no more one and dones because they didn't like Cam's attitude. I think people came in and thought Cam would be, frankly, like Brandon Miller, what Brandon Miller is doing. First off, Brandon Miller's on a way better team. But regardless, an accomplice to murder. Yeah. Yes. Well, he didn't do that. <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's yeah. a plus. Yeah. So he didn't do that. Um, and that's just Although not what it talk was to some be. of our fan base. I think they'd prefer murder to yeah, like, to to, to Cam. Yeah, they prefer that to Cam, like being, I don't know, just like not the most enthusiastic person. Like he's not like screaming on the silence. It's just not his personality, whatever. All this to say, they said no more one and dones. First off, you recruit talent. I don't, I, this is the only thing that you recruit talent. If talent wants to come play for you, you recruit them. Second, Cam wasn't a one and done when he signed. I think that's what people forget. Yeah. He was projected a, like in October of 2021, it was a projected potentially two and done with potential one and done upside, but they weren't sure where it was going to hit. He had an insane season, insane run in the Team USA, and that put him squarely in the first round, the one and done square. Prior to that, it was, oh, he's potentially a two and done, but that's like we've we've been recruiting that the whole time. We knew that with JRE when we got him that he's potentially going to be a two and done. You know, we've seen that before. We had that with, I mean, Omari was a little bit different because it was a redshirt freshman year. Anyways, all that to say, Cam came here to play for Jay Wright. He did not play a second for Jay Wright and still busted his ass, worked hard, and at least from an external perspective, was not a distraction to the team. I'm thankful for Cam. You don't have to love his contributions, but Cam came and played and is a Villanova basketball player, and that's what it was through and through. Thank you, Cam. Go make a bag. And go play so much better than the NBA because you're going to have high-level point guards in space, and it's going to be fun to see for him. Yeah. Anybody saying no more one and dones, uh, we'd be we'd be lucky to have that problem in, in the next couple of years because it's yep. going to be tough to get that level of talent for sure. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, I think I think, Will, your your point is spot on. It's really well taken. Um, he came to play for for Jay. Jay is obviously a different coach, has different mannerisms, does practice differently, brings different things to the table than Kyle does. You have no idea what how he would have been under a Jay Wright tenure could have been a different player. Also, like, I mean, let's not read into it too much. Like, all you see as a fan is you see him on the court, and sure, maybe you can try to read into body language, but at the end of the day, like, you really don't know what's going on in practice. You don't know how much somebody's bought in versus not bought in. To me, I don't know. He always looked like he was he was busting his ass on the court. Yeah, there are some mistakes he made, and I'm just like, eh, whatever. Like, he's still a great player, and I'll take him 10 days out of 10. Like, no questions asked. This wasn't this wasn't like I don't know, this wasn't like a Dom Cheek scenario where it's like, oh no, this is terrible. Like, no, like he, he was a great player. I'd I'd put him on any team that we had for like every time without a That's doubt. That's exactly it. Like when I look at it, I'm like, just like if I told you at the beginning of the year, yeah, Cam averages 12, 13, shoot, 13, 5, and like doesn't get very doesn't pass very well, but gets a steal and a half a game shoots for, like just under 50, 47% from the field, 35% from three, you'd be like, oh, he had a really good year Sounds for like, what we expected. Like that's, that's it. And yeah. 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 I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. yeah it's, it's whatever. And to the folks who are like, I don't see how he's going to be in the NBA guys. No, like, no ball. <laughs> yeah. Guys. Guys, 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 guys. I know that at Villanova, we are used to the Jalen Brunsons, the Mikhail Bridges, the Josh Hart's, the Eric Pascals, and so on and so forth of the world who kind of develop themselves into NBA players. This is different. <laughs> and we've said it from the start, but like this is different. This is not a guy who's who is like showing you. 100% basketball skill all the time. This is a guy who is going to get drafted on upside athleticism. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, this, this is this is what we always we always used to complain about. Because we always make used to make the opposite argument. To be like, oh, well, why aren't the Villanova guys getting drafted? The NBA values athleticism. We made the same argument against it for the past, like, four years. And that was the reason all our guys had to stick around and develop is because they didn't have that upside right. athleticism. So this is the so guy. Therefore, they compensate. So this, yeah, this is the guy who's just like, 
oh yeah, he's hyper athletic. Like, did you look at him? Like, right. did you see the dunk two games ago? Like, that's why he's getting drafted the yeah. first round. Right, right. And and you might say, well, I don't care. These these highlight real dunks are not building up. Ah, whatever, guys. Come oh, on, shut like, the fuck up. like, like. Like, I can tell you a highlight reel dunk in Madison Square Garden that was Villanova basketball. Mikhail Bridges delivered it on Gonzaga's face in 2008, in oh, 2017. So, 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 so it, it can be Villanova basketball. Like, I don't know what to say. Anyway, so Cam Whitmore is not. The, not Villanova with, basketball is just a catch all for a result that you don't like. Yeah, I, right, right, right. Uh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> um, right. Shot so, better from breathing Caleb and Justin and Brandon and Mark. Yeah. So it's pretty, it's pretty good. So one, Cam Whitmore will not be back with the team. Yes. Two, Justin Moore probably, and I'll put that at like a ninety-five percent likelihood. I won't call it a hundred percent because I guess anything could theoretically happen. But Justin Moore turns twenty-three in April. He turns twenty-four the following April. So if he were to stay at Villanova another season. He is only going to be like, he's only going to be 24 by the time he goes to play professionally anywhere. Look, does that mean that he will automatically go play professionally anywhere? No. Do I think he'll go play professionally somewhere? Yeah. I think he's going to move on to a professional level. He could transfer. He has a year of eligibility left. He could transfer. He could do whatever. I'm not going to sit there and speculate that I think that's what's going to happen. I think he's going to go and play professionally. That's where I think it's going to happen. I think people all season were like, what do you mean? Justin Moore's going to come back. Again, clarifying moment here. He didn't play today. If today was an NCAA tournament game, he probably would have played. So, so call, call a spade a spade. I don't think Justin Moore will be back with the team next year. And before you go into any other commentary on that, Here's another guy who tore his Achilles less than a year ago. Less than a year ago. Okay. He played, despite a lot of advice from the same Villanova fans who were giving the advice saying he shouldn't play, like, despite a lot of advice, played a long while and managed to get us from when we were like 10 and 13, helped manage to get us to a point where we even were eligible for an NIT bit. Yeah. We, we were a top 50 team in the country with a healthy team. And that was because of Justin. We saw what it looked like with Cam and Jordan, when it was just Cam, Jordan, and Jordan, and not the, because those are the three people who were missing most of the games. We were a top 50 team with that. Um, to the point of Justin just like getting to the uh, next level, whatever be professional level, I just want to say, I think people like misunderstand because they're like, well, he has NIL. He does. If he wanted to come back, he could get, Let's say, I don't know, I'm going to throw out like he could get somewhere in six figures for NIL being a recognizable face, being one of the best players in the Big East or wherever he if he decided to transfer wherever he wanted to go. But the thing is, he's 23 years old. He's 24 the following year. If he wants to go to the NBA at any point, the math is, do I just want to start now and start that grind? and get there because he he's not going to get drafted so he's going to have to grind anyway so it's like do i start now and get the grind or do i leave like or yeah do i stay get nil money then grind later if the money's not the motivation for him and he just wants to get started his professional journey like welcome him thank him for his time and like give wish him well wishes as he does that that's all i have to say with that all right so that, that really wraps up the the what i would say the known entities are in terms of leaving so four roster spots open plus brizzy you add Briz. yeah you add onto that on the back end of that you add um fucking a um you, you add um jordan dumont jesus christ i don't know why it took me so long to get that out um, i didn't, I didn't even dumont. know i was gonna try and fill it i didn't even know who you're, who you're going for you add dumont and so you have at minimum four roster spots that you need to fill. So we already know that we're hitting the portal on the basis of four roster spots being wide open uh, this season. I guess in theory, you could pick up another late recruit from all the coaching changes that are happening or whatever that you can potentially pick someone else up late. It doesn't really strike me as all that different from a portal guy. So like, you know, you're, you're going to get somewhere of four minimum in the portal. Now, 
to Willie's point before, I don't want to start randomly speculating on other transfers out. But I think we can probably say that the door of the transfer portal is going to work both ways in the offseason. I think that's probably a fair assessment to say right now. Do we know who? No, we don't know who. We actually, we literally do not know. I am not sure they know. Now, at the time of this recording being released, it could be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whenever Brian is able to, to get the editing done. Um, but the but so we might know more, but you might know more than we do as you're listening to this later on. But I think I feel comfortable saying that there will be another transfer, another one transfer at minimum out. Um again, not gonna speculate. You could speculate. I don't want to do that. Um, I would encourage as many players as possible to stay because given the aforementioned roster spots that are leaving, you have four people that are moving on who all earned 30 minutes a game. There's going to be a lot of minutes available on a program that forgetting everything else, forgetting Jay Wright, forgetting, forgetting the national championships, forgetting whatever, a Big East program with excellent facilities. Um, that plays on national television every single game, every single game, and is in the and is just outside Philadelphia, plays in the Big East Conference with the Big Five, and has a lot, a lot of notoriety and following throughout the country. So, so right then there, there's a lot to like about Villanova, absent all the other stuff that we've kind of built up over the years. And if you're just taking it at face value, you have you have at minimum that so 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 there will be so there will be some re-recruiting that needs to go on and then there will be some recruiting that needs to go on specifically in the portal which has already really started and has gotten off to a really hot start it is we're probably as of right now as of this recording well over 300 people in the in in the portal um and so it is uh going to be an interesting off season to say the least that number is only going to grow i think last season got well over a thousand kids in the portal um we're at 400 plus what's what's really interesting is especially for somebody who's in kyle's position where you know we talked about this earlier in the year where the most important recruiting that he did last summer was making sure that Mark was committed, that Cam was committed, et cetera. And as a result, it seemed like the recruiting for this next class kind of took a backseat. Yes, we have, we do have Jordan Dumont, as you alluded to coming in, but that's it. And in pretty much any other year, you would say that seems like a miss. And I was just talking to this, uh, making this point on, on our Slack group, the idea that if you only had one guy coming in and had to fill that with, say, graduate transfers a few years ago would be a potential travesty. And like you'd be really absolutely set up for failure. Given how the portal works now and given that you have people who are looking to make moves much earlier in their career, there is an opportunity to get some talent earlier on or to pick up some of these guys who are actually coming in as freshmen and are looking to make a move because, you know, some coach changed or whatever it is. So the best case scenario in my mind is that we pick up a guy, a few guys who have, you know, multiple years of eligibility left so you can buy into whatever Kyle's selling so you can actually see them develop within the program and give Kyle and the program a little bit more runway to actually build and grow versus just filling this with a bunch of seniors or grad students who have one year left. So I'm cautiously optimistic if we play our cards right here and we're aggressive in here, we can actually use this like we would have used a regular recruiting class in the past. Is it going to be that effective? Yeah, maybe not. But I think there's more upside than there would have been, say, three or four years ago. That's for sure. And at that, like to the, to your point, now we're getting the chance. And I, I, like, I understand there's the a lot of Villanova fans are like, well, I want my four-year Villanova player. I want the person who we see as a freshman come in and all that kind of stuff if it feels better. I completely understand that feeling, but it's also super valuable where, like, I don't know who just entered the portal. I mean, he left already, but uh, already signed. But J.J. Starling, who was coming, who came into Notre Dame, thought he was going to be a draft pick, 
already committed to Syracuse, but we already saw from Syracuse's perspective, they've now seen that this guy averaged 12, four and four at Notre Dame. And they're like, that's great. I don't need to worry about this kid translating mm-hmm. because I've already mm-hmm. seen that he's translated to this level. Yep. And yes, there's obviously levels to it where you might have someone coming from a smaller level who has like a, like, a, like, I don't like Joe Cremo. Like, yeah, Joe Cremo didn't transfer the way that we thought translate the way we better. He thought he would. And there was different reasons around that. That just comes to the actual like evaluation portion of it. But as, as if you take a step back, you're able to be like, well, I know this person can play at this level at the very least. I know from a picking up schemes perspective, from a understanding how game flows go from a speed of the game that they're going to be able to pick it up because they've seen it before as compared to a high school kid where there's going to be barring being cam being Brandon Miller, being any, like a super high, even their super high level freshmen who haven't figured out like Derek lively at Duke literally has figured it out in the last month. Jalen hood, Shafino, Indiana took like two ish months and now has figured it out. So it takes time to figure it out. That time to figure it out is going to be way less with, people who have played before, whether they are sophomores, juniors, seniors, whatever it looks like. It's going to be interesting. I don't know who's coming. I don't know who's going, but there's a chance to like, it doesn't have to be a complete step back, which I think people are worried about. I mean, I think it could be to, to be fair. Yeah, oh, yeah, I think there, there's a, there's a very real chance that next year is a, is a very rough go of things. But, but before we jump to that, I do want to, I do want to build on a point that you mentioned, Willie, like, People saying, oh, I want my four-year players. That's all well and good. Obviously, Jay Wright is not around anymore. But even if Jay Wright was around, the fact of the matter is the NCAA is going to be very different in a year or two than it has been the past five years because of how the portal is acting and how that's impacting how people think about their careers in the NCAA. So the idea of getting these four-year players is going to be more challenging for Villanova. It's going to be more challenging for everybody else as well, too. And you may just have to kind of get used to having a bit of a different pattern and figuring out and redefining what a Villanova player actually is because you have that aspect and you have a new coach. So put whatever yeah. a Villanova player is in the rearview mirror and, and I don't know, get a, get accustomed to the idea of thinking about it differently. The one point I want to make, <laughs> the fact that Jay Wright's no longer coaching – and the fact that this is now a new reality are uh, very linked in in in, yeah. in 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 why that is why both are this way they are. Um, yeah, look, guys, a few things here. One, Providence under Cooley, which might change to Georgetown under Cooley. <laughs> we'll see about that. Um, but Providence under Cooley has been a culture program the whole entire time. Now, obviously they haven't done it to the level we've done it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think any, any, I don't think we need to really push that bit or whatever too hard, but like that's been a culture program. They have fully, wholeheartedly embraced the portal. They've been successful in doing so. Very, I would add. That team won the Big East regular season, asterisks, whatever you want to put on it, last season. That team made a tournament this year when they were picked like sixth or seventh in the conference. Okay. They have been very successful in the portal. And, oh, by the way, up until very recently, for the last like 18, 19 months, 20 months or whatever, have been extremely wired together. So those players have bought in to a program in a very short period of time. Now you're going to next comment from there. It's obviously something along the lines of like, uh, well, but you know, the freshmen don't get it right away. There's defensive schemes and whatever that the freshmen don't get. That goes back to the speed of the game comment guys. Like, like everyone switches in the NBA. And like almost everybody, almost every defense switches in the NBA. And yet those guys who didn't play switching defense in, in the, in the college game, get into the NBA and after some time kind of get it right. Like, so, so like point being is to the speed of the game comment, these guys are strong physical guys who have been in a weight training program, who have been in a food program, who have been in a, who have been in a, um, who have been played the college game 
and can can actually be harnessed and be put to work very quickly. So look, I'm not sitting here and saying that this is going to be just like the way it was, because it's not. But just because it's not the way it was doesn't mean that it's not a good way forward. Like we can't be mentally stuck in the past of like what how we used to define the Villanova basketball player, uh-huh. because candidly, the rest of the college world moved on from that about five, six years ago. And the only reason why it kind of hung around for us is because of Jay. So, so, so we, we, we now have to play a little bit of catch up in, in terms of that. So we're going to get a lot of guys in the portal. I think where we want, and Willie, I know you got, I can see you have a point to be made, but after that, I think we actually want to talk about who do we need to get in the portal? Not necessarily names, but what do the players need to look like? The point I wanted to make was of the all Big East first team, second team, honorable mention, there's 15 spots. How many of them are transfers? Give a guess. Well, Kolek was a player of the year. He's a transfer. Yep. Sule Boom was a transfer. Yep. Bryce Hopkins was a transfer. That's first team. So that's all for first team. So I've got three, and, three and oh, by the way, the three best players in the Big East this season. Yep. All transfers. Okay. That's wild. Um So from there, I, I'm just like I'm drawing a blank on everybody else, but like, but from there, I would venture a guess that you probably have another six guys. It's seven, so seven total. Okay. It's Colek Hopkins, boom. Soriano was a Fordham transfer like three wow. years ago. Shireman Carter Nunji, all wow. transfers. That's wild. Yeah, that's just and of those transfers. Carter, Hopkins, boom, all just started last year. Holick's been there for a year. Oh, and Shireman. I mean, so four of the four of them had have only been on the team for one year. Right. These are Big East Catholic schools. Yep. But like, like, and oh, by the way, like St. John's side, Holick's on a team that's Final Four good. Sule Boom's on a team that's Elite Eight good. Shireman's on a team that's maybe Sweet 16 max good, maybe Elite 8 max good. But like, but like all those teams were in playing semifinal Friday in the Big East tournament. Yep. Not us. They were. So, so like before we like, like Rob, I get Rob, this goes to your point a little bit. Like before we go on this whole path of oh, culture, 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 whatever, it's like play hard, smart, together. Like, oh, really? You yeah. think all the things that kind of make a basketball player a team work the way it's supposed to work. But, like, look, guys, the reality of the situation is in this world of transfers and NIL, I think some people have been, like, have been so disconnected from it because it's, like, incentives seem to be different and, to their mind, wrong. Yeah. No, the incentives are a little bit different, but now the now the response from these programs needs to be to embrace the different a little bit and understand how to sell back to a player. Like, no, well, you guys as as now being paid a little bit of money and having the authority to transfer. Well, guess what? While you're here, you need to learn how to like like real world here. You need to learn how to contribute. Because if you don't contribute, then you don't prove yourself to potentially move on to the next level. There is still a lot of, of power in the, in the, like in the programs, if you will. So it's just a give and take. That's a little bit different now. And I think we just need to get comfortable with that as a program because, because if we don't take full advantage of the transfer portal this off season, we are going to be like this. this, Well, it'll be like, Death sentence. We fucked. Yeah. I said it before in this podcast. Adapt or die. Yeah. Point blank. And I don't think, by the way, I think most of the fan base understands this. I think that there's a thought that, that, uh, well, if you don't want to be here, like go yeah. take a walk and this, that, and the other thing and whatever. I think that is permeating through the fan base. And I kind of get that like a little bit, but like, look, I, here's what I'll say. If a player wants to move on via a transfer, unless they evaluate the pool and come back, then like, then like we have to not view this as like a death to the program type of type of situation. TCU's Eddie Lampkin is in the transfer portal. 
That guy like won them a game in this in the NCAA tournament last season. <laughs> you know what this like, is? You know what this is akin to? You know, I just thought about this. This is like, this is like comparing our parents' generation to us when it comes to jobs, where it was like, oh, your career, you have one one company you work for your whole career. Oh, me. you you That's left. Me. Yeah, I know. You're, you're, you're the exception. You're old school. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm um, the boomer on the podcast. Yeah, basically. Um, but but same thing of like, oh, how how could you? I remember why I left my first company after two years in the workforce. Uh, which, by the average way, we always make fun of this. The average uh, tenure for a, a millennial is like two and a half years or almost three years at, at their company, whatever. So point being, like, it shifted from, hey, you stay at the company, that's what the norm is, to, yeah, you bounce around and you experience different things. This, to me, is no different. This is an, Will, at your point, this is an evolution of college basketball. It's an evolution, and frankly, like, it's a it's a good thing in, in terms of people development, right? Like, you have an opportunity, you get to grow your skill set and find potentially a better opportunity for yourself. And it's just something that we have to get used to. So anyway, I'm just echoing the same points that we made with an interesting analogy. So continue on. Continue on, Boomer. So, well, <laughs> Boomer wants results. <laughs> I want answers. Okay, so answers. Let's get some answers on the table. What do we need in the portal? <laughs> what do we need in the portal, guys? So like so like just from a roster construction standpoint, the number one and two priorities in terms of like re-recruiting players got to be Eric and 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 Mark. I don't think it's a surprise to anybody say that. That's not to say that everyone else isn't a priority, but let's just put that let's just put that in context. So so like Mark's got to have the in order in order to do that. Mark's got to have the keys to the program next season in terms of the guard level, um, and then and then. Eric has to have, you know, is got to be the feature forward, if you will. But the one thing that we got to acknowledge here first, first and foremost, is that Eric Dixon is not a five, right? Like, and, and I think we just need to get out and say that, right? Like we, everyone wants him to be Omari Spellman so bad, but he's like four inches shorter and, and is just, and that's just not his position. Okay. So he's, he's built himself and I give him enormous credit because despite the fact that he's not been a five, He's one of the most competitive, best big mans in the Big East. And that's an enormous credit to his work ethic and talent. Um, an enormous, enormous credit to that. But he needs to like trim down and become a four in, in the college game. Because if he is to go to the next level, then that's his path, right? Like his next, his next role in a professional level is going to be at the four position. Maybe even the three. But neither here nor there at the four. So so point being is my number one priority this year, after watching how this team got out rebounded in a ton of games, after watching how this team struggled to score underneath, after watching this team get shots blocked, and this, that, and the other thing is my number one priority is a five. We need a five in the portal. That's my number one priority. Like, like literally that's it. And I think we might need two. From like just a depth perspective. I hear yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely I, I definitely hear you. And yeah, Eric, if he's going to go to the next level, it's gonna be as a four. Um and he just needs to we need to give him the runway to do that. Um I think the things I think about that we need is I mean, I could look go through the whole list, but the I I think it's two wings. Yep. Two high level wings. We lost Cam, we lost Slater, and realistically, Moore and Caleb. All four of them functionally have been wings at times. Maybe we can call Justin just a point guard, but Caleb, Slater, Whitmore, all wings. We need to be able to replace that production. So we need to look for high level wings um, to to replace that production. Ideally, on the younger side, like if we could find great sophomores, pull them in. But the di- the issue becomes it's just there's less great sophomore wings in the portal than there are you know good senior wings or good junior wings because if they're that great as a sophomore. There's a higher chance that they have a real like that they're gonna go to the next level or anything like that. So there's just there's roster math to do, but I think those two wings need to be come in and realistically i don't care about their like they just need to play whatever basketball kyle neptune wants them to play like that's what they need to be able to do um i was going to say villanova basketball but it, that might 
shift a little bit of what Kyle wants it to look like next year. So as long as they can do that and do that at a Big East starter, if not Big East, like honorable mention level, that's what I want to see. But let's say Big East starter level, and like let's assume Eric is the first team all Big East player. Like that's what I need to see from them. And then I think the last part is a guard. You know? Yeah, I, I was gonna I was gonna try to rat it out. I I think it's I like where you guys we we obviously need a we need a, a five. I mean you could get by without it. I think I, I want to go back to the point you were making, Chris, about Eric. Um, you know, it's interesting. Like, I, I love Eric. I've been a huge proponent of Eric. I, I would like to see him play the four because I think our team is more dynamic with him playing the four. I think he still has, like, a decent amount of skill development, if I'm being honest, uh, to be able to play that four effectively, though. He's still got to get way more comfortable with the ball in his hands and being able to drive a bit. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I'm with you in that. Like, let's get the five. Um, yeah, to me, I, I want a guard. Like, I'm totally comfortable with Mark taking the reins next year. Then the question is, okay, so what happens if Mark's in foul trouble, Mark's having a rough game, or I don't know, Mark gets hurt? Well, right now it's basically you're back to to Arch. And, you know, we saw the limitations of that earlier this year. We know what that story is. We know what that offense looks like with the ball in his hands. Is he serviceable for, you know, the 10 minutes a game? Sure. Is that what you want? No, I'd rather have somebody who I can pair with Mark if we don't want to run two guards there who can be perhaps a little bit more of like probably a two and kind of a score first punch, if you will. So that's that's another thing I'd like to add. So I don't know. We're kind of adding people across the board, which I guess is really the takeaway from the season. There are a lot of holes that we have to fill. We have a lot of we have a lot of holes to fill. Look, the the um the reality of the situation is that with when it comes to Arch, there's a lot of postmortem because a lot of people just like want to just say Arch, 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 Arch. Look, we've been very clear on this. Arch as like a ninth, tenth guy who is like a who is like a culture guy, who is a who is a guy who works his ass off in practice, who challenges the the guys on the team, etc. In that role is is a that's that's great for him, and he wants to be here. Plays his ass off, works his ass off. I don't blame a kid for not having the inherent talent that everybody else does. We got in a position this year where we're so short on the bench that that he played significant minutes. I think he I think he should be playing in those spot minute roles where you need to get somebody who can do who can handle the ball, you trust him enough, and and can do those things. That's all I want to say about that because it's just been like an ad nauseum conversation that we've had all season long. And I, and I think that's the role that we have to find a way to get back into at the start of next season. Um, all right. So that's kind of hits on the portal. Talk a little bit of expectations. We'll be following that um, both on Twitter and, and what else is to come. One final piece of, of, um, of homework on the season was there was news that, um, uh, that Coach George was was uh, a prime candidate um, for the Bucknell head coaching position. I don't know if there will be other head coaching positions that he might be sought for, um, but he but John Fanta reported that he's he's a he's a high he's a high end candidate for that position, and um, and that's so so one thing that we're definitely going to see. Because I don't think it's going to be, I don't think it's a secret at this point, but we're definitely going to see uh, moving on uh, on the coaching staff. And all I'll say in response to that is, is if I'm the coaching staff, I start with two names. And then from there, I am I like, we'll move on from there. But like, provided jo- Coach George moves on, I would say like, let's move to, um, let's move to either Ash Howard um, who obviously we spoke with um, as part of his role with the NIL, but let's just like he has head coaching experience at LaSalle. Obviously, he can go great there, but like, but like he has head coaching experience, a little bit older guy. Um, I think that experience will be will be helpful for Neptune or a guy like a Tom Pacora who's at Quinnipiac with Baker right now, um, who is also a former head coach, knows X's and O's and that type of thing. I think Kyle, as a young head coach, really could use somebody with a little bit more um, life experience, coaching, ex- head coaching experience. Um, 
whether that's positive or negative, like you still get that experience to learn from that. And I think he would benefit from having an older head there, a little bit more maturity on the roster. Cause right now, like everyone in the Villanova program is like under 40, right? Yeah. Like, which is like just really unusual. So I feel like you need to get a guy who's a little bit older and not to say, not to say coach Ash or whatever is old, but like older. And that experience I think will be helpful on the, on the, uh, on the roster for the team. I also think it would be interesting just to get a pair of fresh eyes, like Ash's mm-hmm. fresh ish eyes, but just like, what if, I mean, Kyle has connections. There's other people who, there's other people who are not, who haven't been embedded in the program in the last 10 years who would still be valuable and still kind of understand Villanova. And also to a greater point, whatever the shift Kyle wants it to be. Uh, once the villain would come back. So if we don't go the Ash way, which I would love to see, I think just some sort of fresh eyes, I think would be really cool. Um, yeah, that's really all I have on that. We'll see what happens if George gets the Bucknell job or anything else like that. Um, yeah, we, yeah, we got we got to have a change. Kyle just needs he needs to bring in the guys that he wants, both obviously from a player perspective, as we talked about, but importantly from a coaching perspective. He needs his own stamp. He needs his own flavor on it. And I want to see – somebody different. So we're not trying to, again, I don't know what goes on in practice, but I want Kyle to come out with a firm style, a firm approach that that's his and take yeah. a chance on, on him and be able to sell that to his guys. And I think a, a new coaching staff will have that. And will again, similar to the players, like we'll come in and buy in for Kyle and not be somebody who bought in to Jay and was looking to Jay. And I think that's an important distinction. Right. And Rob, let me ask you something. You brought up your, your work experience before, but how did you respond when you were getting managed by someone who's roughly your age? Uh, I mean, it's it's different. I think it's, <laughs> uh, I, I will say, someone who's your age is can be okay. I think it's it's challenging, though, when you see somebody who was basically in the same position that you were in and then, you know, got promoted ahead of you, which is, you know, kind of what happened you know kyle was an assistant coach he was there you know obviously uh, uh a few years more than uh than some of the other guys but it can be a, a little bit weird where you say hey like does this guy really know all that much more than me and at the same time that can certainly play into the person who got promoted as well too where they're kind of looking over their shoulder and be like ah, you know do i know as much now presumably all these guys are type a personalities where they think of themselves highly enough that they have the confidence to be declarative and say, yeah, I'm, I'm the best for this job for sure. But it, it can create a bit of a weird scenario and a weird dynamic. So you have to imagine that that plays into things a little bit, even with the best team players. So again, just another reason of like, I want somebody who's coming in for Kyle and is all on board for that. Yep. All right, let's move on. Women's team. Let's get some women. Let's talk yeah. about this. Let's get some women. Let's yeah, get I, some I said, women. <laughs> the full came out of my let's mouth and some, I was like, oh. Let's get some get women. some women. Rachel's not here. Guys, free for all. Growing oh, out. Boy. Oh, my gosh. Amazing. Um, let's get some women. No. So, so let's talk about this. Sorry, Rob's laughing. <laughs> We're hosting two games. Well, one. Oh, my gosh. Two. We're hosting two games, Willie. I actually think that we technically are hosting two games no matter what. Like, even if we lose, I think we have to host that second round. Yes. Game. So, yes. But <laughs> we're playing in two, hopefully. Yes. Um, but the uh, but Villanova women uh, helmed by Denise Dillon and uh, and the uh, and Maddie Segrist are uh, a four seed in the NCAA tournament. Before we talk to you, or no, right before, right after we spoke with you last time. Is what I meant to say. Um, they lost in the final to UConn uh, in that in that in the uh, Big East tournament final, but uh, that didn't hurt them. They were a four seed in the bracket reveal. They are a four seed now um, in the NCAA tournament, so they are um, ready and raring to go. And as a four seed, as we just alluded to, they have the opportunity to host games. So, 5 p.m. on Saturday. Villanova will host an NCAA tournament game live on campus. It's real. It's happening. It'll be there. The NCAA tournament will be at Villanova. Um, And so in the FID, um, we will be playing Cleveland State. 
Um, and so in a 413 matchup, um, the there's only single game, there's only single seat tickets available. So we are looking at a sellout or a near sellout here um in the fin. So that's that's obviously awesome. Um, and in addition to that, if we move on past that, we play in all likelihood Washington State, um, who is our five seat. Now, I don't need to tell you just from like a location standpoint how good of a draw this 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 is. I don't know a ton about either Cleveland State or Washington State. But what I do know is I got to travel Cleveland State a little bit less so a pretty long way to play in a home arena for Villanova. And specifically Washington State has a long way to go um to play in the fin. So if Villanova can go ahead and win two games and advance to the Sweet 16, which would be just a, a big feat for the program, we have the opportunity to likely play one-seeded Indiana. Now, one thing changed about the about the program, uh, about the NCAA tournament on the women's side this year. Those regions have now been condensed into uh, into two into two sites two with sites. two sites each hosting two regions so we are in greenville two um now in the past it used to be like hartford connecticut hosted a region and that was like a big topic of conversation last year because yukon was the two seed in the region that was hartford <laughs> and everyone was really pissed because yukon basically dominated that that region and then got to go to the uh they got to go to the final four playing as a two seed in a region that was in their home area. But like, basically there's two super regionals. I'll call them for lack of a better word. And we're in Greenville two, which is in South Carolina. So we would have the opportunity to play the one seed Indiana, but not have to play them in Indiana. We get to play them in South Carolina. So both teams have to travel a good way, but that's still an advantage when you compare it to having to potentially be in South Carolina, who's the overall one seeds bracket, uh, and have to play that one seed, which would not go uh, particularly well. So, so I feel like we got probably as good of a draw as you could ask for um, in this women's tournament. And I think there's a legitimate, honest to God's chance that this team can make a final four run. <laughs> like, like I honestly believe this is possible. <laughs> I I do too. I kind of love our draw um i was like i think we match up decently well versus indiana um indiana is the one seed so assuming we get past the we get past cleveland we beat assumedly washington state um that we would have indiana assuming they went out but i like that and then i look like i look at this there like I, i think nc state's a decent team as a seven but that's the other side of the bracket and lsu is really good um, and is our th- is the three seed, and so is Utah as a two. But like, if we see them, we're in the lead eight, and that's just basketball. You know, that's a couple dribbles, that's a missed free throw away from being the final four. So, this team has a chance to make a run. So, yeah, the men's team lost in the NIT, but there's a team here that's gearing up, has home court advantage for two games, and has the talent to at least make it to Dallas. Um, so, gear up. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm super amped for this. Um, and we're just going to see Maddie play basketball. You know, that's like, at the end of the day, we're going to like, you have a chance to watch the best basketball player on Villanova's campus continue to play basketball in March on a top seed, which is all you can ask for. hundred percent. Very true. I don't have a whole lot more to ask other than it's pretty fucking cool that, I don't know. I remember a few years ago thinking about how the women's team, I was like, I never hear a whole lot of them. Like, are oh, they like, all that good and obviously uh Beretta was a very good coach but very well respected coach but the success they've had the past couple of years has been awesome and now to be talking about realistically and obviously we're hopeful um but still being somewhat realistic about hey there's a chance we can make a final four like that's pretty pretty big leaps and bounds for the program so kudos to denise dylan um and certainly for to maddie for everything they've accomplished it's pretty awesome yeah yep no i mean and we're going to be following them so so I'm I'm very very excited to see uh to see what they have to offer. All right, we have literally three minutes left. So 
real quick, guys. Men's NCAA tournament. Men's NCAA tournament. Let me hear it. Like Big East wise, let's just focus on them. Big East wise, what 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 do you guys think? I have hot takes. Um, I have Marquette losing out of Vermont, and like okay, like that's aggressive, but like I I don't have Marquette advancing far. I'm being like I'm playing the bracket game by picking Vermont to beat them, but realistically, I don't think Marquette makes it past the Sweet Sixteen. I have Xavier. Sweet 16. I have UConn Elite Eight losing to Gonzaga. Um, and I have Creighton Sweet 16. Um, yeah, so that's where my biggies and Providence. I have beating Kentucky and then losing to Kansas State, who is my sneaky final four pick. All right, I've got Providence out against Kentucky because they're falling apart. I'm gonna go uh UConn. I don't buy UConn, I haven't been on the Bilotti train, so I've got UConn out. I'll give them Sweet 16 at least. I'll give UConn Sweet 16. I'm going to give Xavier, uh, Sean Miller, benefit of the doubt here. I'll give him the Elite Eight. I'm going to give Marquette the Elite Eight as well, and I'll give Creighton uh, round of 32. I am a fucking homer, and I love it. <laughs> I love it. So not only do I have Providence beating the allegations, <laughs> beating Kentucky, despite all distractions pointing to the otherwise, which I'm not sure. I just picked the 6 11, and I, that was the one with the Big East team. So that was literally being honest a homer pick. Literally just like I wanted one 6 11. I don't think I had a single one in my bracket. So I looked around my 6 11s and I was like, oh, Big East team, I'll pick that one. Um, Bryce Hopkins revenge game, except Cooley's last game. So <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> It's a lot going on. Um, but with one minute remaining, I have Marquette in the final four. I've I've decided that I've decided that they have proven me wrong, like so significantly that like I just need to buy in at this point. And so mm-hmm. now they're gonna prove me wrong. Um I'm fucking sticking on the Yukon train. I'm 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 all over it. I got them all the way into the national championship game. I do. I'm just being honest. I have them there. Um I have what? So Twitter's going to suck if that happens. Yeah, really bad. I have Creighton um, losing to uh, Alabama, I think it is, in the Elite Eight. And I have, uh, who's the S? Xavier losing in the Elite Eight. So I have two Big East Final Four teams because I'm fucking nuts. So, so fuck it. Let's just ride because, you know what? It's about time other Big East schools fucking step up. How about that? This is the year the other Big East schools step up. That's my belief. There it is. And with that, see you, Rick Patino, soon. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for listening. And as always, let's go, Nova. <laughs>